Good to be back. Nice to be in front of you again. Uh, we have some people on the workshop, so that's, they're talking about the future, and we're going to be talking about the present. So, as you see, and maybe as most of you know, I usually get on stage with an interesting theme uh, that is very pro provocative, and there's usually something behind it. So, treat today's session as a therapy, a group therapy to complain about the present and about the people that surround you that annoy the shit out of you. So yeah, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Roman Gluck. I'm a product manager at Pentalog. In my free time, I do startup consultancy and I'm a tracker. And also, of course, I do public speaking mentoring. Uh, most of the speakers that were here to, in this conference were trained by me, and it's always a pleasure, and I have a very good benefit. Anton, you don't know about this, but I have an advantage over all the participants. I already know the presentation, so I can socialize. That's one of the main reasons why I do it. So yeah, uh, enough about me. Uh, oh, uh, one more thing that I really like uh, to do is I love collecting stories. And um, some of you don't know, but I give, give it to this information privacy. I always do my presentation the day before the presentation. So I tell the speakers, please do it one week in advance, and I do it. I finish doing these slides today morning. <laughs> Why do I do it? Uh, because my presentation is always uh, a little bit philosophical, it's all, and it's always about the present. So yesterday with some of you, I talked. I took your stories. Don't worry, I won't say your names. But some of your stories will be in this presentation. So that's why the presentation was always done at the last time, because it's always about the present, it's always about the people. Uh, so yeah, but uh, remark, don't expect any names, don't expect company names. Uh, the stories I tell you might be about me, they might be about some of the people in the audience, it might be about people that I just know from the industry, uh, but it's all regional stories. It's not something that's happening in the US, not something that's happening in China, no. It's regional, most of the stories are from here, people that encounter them here. So, let's set the stage. Uh, what exactly are we going to be talking about pinpointing and how do you, sh you should look at this presentation? Because when we talk about human interaction, it's always complicated. So I need to put some limits for you to understand how much are we going to be talking about. So all of you have this, I want to work at, insert company name. So all of you at some point decided to work in a company. And the main question is always, how did you decide it? What was your incentive to work at a specific company? Well, there's an answer for that. There's statistics. I love statistics. Uh, if you go to Statista, there's a source in it. If you're curious, there are actually a lot more reasons, but the main ones are like salary, 84%. Totally normal. We work for the money. It's not, it shouldn't be shameful to recognize that we work for the money, but we also work for other stuff like work-life balance, opportunity of advancement, and much more. But that's not the interesting thing. For me, the interesting thing is why people leave companies. That's the more interesting part because the reasons are totally different. And if we look at the numbers here, we look something interesting. Lack of career development, inadequate compensation is on, on the second place. So money is already not on the first place. Then you get uncaring, uninspiring leaders, lack of meaningful work, unsustainable work expectations, unreliable, unreliable colleagues, and so on and so forth. And if you look at all of these, they could be described by two words, bad management. So I'm gonna be talking specifically about all of the bad management that's happening in the companies you work in and how to identify the symptoms that maybe it's not the best company to work or maybe there should be change in where you work. So again, treat this as a therapy session. It's a safe space also when the pizza will arrive. I will, uh, I will ask you to raise hands so you can feel comfortable, cozy in this audience. And uh, please, after the presentation is done, approach me and we can talk more because I can only say so much from the stage because all of this is recorded, it's on public record, so I can't say too much, but I can say something. So, let's talk about the companies. I'll share with you a couple of stories so you can find yourself in these interesting situations. The first one, my favorite one because it's the most common one because I work with startups, I see a lot of people. Awesome teams, up to 10 people. None of them have experience. They decide, let's open a company. We're gonna be amazing. We're smarter than everybody else. We have this amazing technology. We have a CEO that did a course on Google. We have some technical guys that just finished university. They have a lot of drive, a lot of energy. And you're 
uh, somewhat like middle, se middle developer that's joining this team with the hopes of, I'm gonna get so much cool stuff, stuff out of this, I'm gonna learn a lot of stuff. And you enter the company, all is fine, everybody's so enthusiastic, it's like a small group of friends, family, all is cool for the first three months. Then you kind of understand, I can't learn anything here. Everybody's at the same level as I am. Uh, there's no meaningful uh, management here because everybody's just fresh out of the university. They have no actual manage managerial experience. And you stick with them for a year. That's what I saw most of the times. In small, small teams survive for like a year, nine months to one year. And then at some point they decide, I can't live with this, I don't have a, enough salary, I have to leave this company immediately right now because I can't survive. And my parents are telling me I have to get out of the house. So that's the first story. The second one is a medium business. You have like 50, 60 people. Again, you're a middle developer, you're joining a team, they have an awesome Instagram page, they have an awesome Facebook page, they, good, like, they get, give you good promotions, they have a fantastic coffee machine during the interview, you see a lot of cheerful, happy faces, cool, let's go in there. And the salary is okay, it's, it's, it's decent. So you go in there, and first two days are lovely, and after like two weeks you start understanding, okay, the boss is super moody, Yes, he's a good expert, but he doesn't, again, because it's a fresh company, they just grew out of being a startup and they started hiring very fast people. They have no structure. They have no understanding how to organize people. They barely have an HR. And you don't know who to address for problems. And you kind of feel that you can't actually expose your opinion because you saw previous colleagues being called out and shouted out by the, by the boss because he thinks, oh, I'm the boss and I can shout at anyone. Any feelings uh, who encountered this? No? I, I want to ask you to raise hands. I'm just curious. I'll look at the faces. The faces will tell me everything. And my favorite one, the enterprise giant. I work a lot with enterprises. Uh, I don't know if the story I'm going to tell you next is uh, mine or somebody else's. Uh, but again, middle developer or any person of middle position, again, striving to work, the the job promises you, we have mentors, we have professionals, and that is true. They will actually mentor you. They give you a good surviving salary, or a decent surviving salary, depends. And everything is fine for the first, first three months, you're onboarding to the company. The problem with enterprise, you have to onboard really, really slow, that's just the reality of enterprise. Three months pass, everything's fantastic, you're finally feeling comfortable, and then, boom, budget cut and you lose your job, you lose your position, and it's happening all over Zoom, and you can't even connect with your colleagues because you were disconnected on the spot after it was announced that your budget cut it and your position is no longer needed. Awesome, right? Yeah, and then, the obvious, and then, and then you, you're disappointed, and then you go here. The independent freelancer, the freedom of being your own boss making decisions for yourself. Uh, and you go to Upwork, you go on Fiverr, and you start putting out, uh, like, I'm a developer, I can make you a mobile app very fast in one week. And then you have your first client, and then you're kind of like, okay, the client wants this package, but they also want extra, and you're like, oh, this is my first client, or maybe I'll be extra careful with him, I'm gonna give him something extra just for free, because I want to be uh, good with him, and then, the client, a week passes and the client asks more, and then more, and then more again, and then you ask him, hey, I'm doing all of this extra stuff, uh, it's time to pay me extra for this, and the client, well, why? And then you get into this amazing cycle of negotiation, and you really don't want that. In the previous companies, the salespeople were dealing with, the, with this bullshit. Product managers, project managers, they were dealing with all of this, and suddenly you realize you, ha you have all of the responsibilities, and you have to be both a salesperson, a project manager, the executor, finance, all of the stuff. So, what's the problem? Is there actually any solution to all of this? Um, we will discover as we go, because the answer is vague, but all of these stories have something in common. They have a person that made a decision at some point. Was it your management? Was it you? Was it someone else? But there always is someone that makes the decision. So let's talk about bad decisions, and specifically bad management. 
So this will be a small collection of stories or situations that I'm gonna tell you about, and we can discuss them over coffee, because again, I can't tell you much on stage. But I want to give you this output so you can feel that the, the pain is real, it's not only you, and it's not because of you. So my favorite one is when a company doesn't give you any explanations for their actions. Amazing, lovely. Who had a, um, an order or a project or some bad decisions that was in the last half year that had no explanation given? Please raise a hand. Hmm, so many lucky people that didn't have a situation like this. Other people should envy you. Uh, then my favorite one that kind of goes with this one is because reasons. This is a personal trauma thing because whenever parents or a person of authority said, why, and I asked, why like this? And because I said so. Totally reasonable explanation in a company where you want transparency and understanding how to proceed forward, because I said so. And this is something you will see at all levels, doesn't matter the size of the company, it's all about the bad management. And uh, this is a very big red sign for me always because with a manager like this, I don't know what to expect. And especially I don't know the decisions. And for you as an executor, it's super important to understand why it's like this. And if you're not given that answer, well, you have a problem. Uh, then something that you should be always aware if you work in an enterprise company and your company is on the stock market. If the stock of the company drops, do you know what happens? Budget cut, yeah. Uh, so you, this is something you have to be aware, and this is unfortunately the reality that you're gonna, should be always aware about. If a company is on the stock market and your company is affected by some external force or even internal, you should always be ready and understanding that there might be budget cuts because unfortunately the CEO of the company, even if they're a good person, and even if they really care, Oh, uh, guys, who wants pizza or who didn't get specifically pizza during lunch? Please raise your hands so the volunteers can... Please, yeah, raise your hands pizza. and keep them up in the air before you get some food. Yes. Girls, <laughs> please enter, enter the room. Like, do not take much, but yeah, at least something for you to keep you alive <laughs> till the end. And the girls will, will make yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, you have this food. And also, Roma, I think you can uh, continue this yeah. thing. Yeah, so... Yeah, but we are we will be as as we discussed fixing it in production. Yeah, everything is fine. This is fixing okay. production. So yeah, coming back, uh, you always understand that even if the CEO has best intentions for the team. Unfortunately, he will be forced to uh, cut people because otherwise he's removed. And you understand that from a survival perspective, the CEO will protect his position. And it's also actually even worse if a CEO is removed because then a new CEO comes and then he uh, kills the position and the mood for everybody else. So please understand when this is happening, it's most of, often the times not you, is the situation that's happening and the company unfortunately has an obligation to stakeholders. So you can't really do much about it. Then my, also one of my favorite ones because uh, this is something you will experience, especially again in big enterprises, allegedly. Uh, keeping secrets, especially corporations, they always have a lot of secrets behind, and there is a small solution, coffee lunches and coffee breaks with colleagues from different departments. So here you have to play a little bit of Game of Thrones always. If you want to be on point and understand what's happening in the company, you have to make good friends and good relationships to counteract this, because sometimes the secrets will be intentional, Sometimes the secrets will be unintentional because people are afraid of their job positions again. So this, I never keep, I never, never keep it that much against people unless there's one point in the presentation, there is one situation where secrets cannot exist. But again, if you want to, hide, want to know more, uh, go for coffee breaks with, with colleagues. Expectations about the future. If your manager is not communicating this directly to you, you will have a problem because you don't know what to expect. So. This actually should be, in my opinion, your obligation to ask the manager what's their expectation about your future position in the team you are in and about the project you are. If you don't ask this question, the future will happen to you and you will not even notice it. So better actually ask this in advance. Ignoring professionals, this maybe is a personal frustration uh, I hate a lot, is when somebody hires me, so they value my opinion for some reason, we go into a meeting, I tell them the exact solution, how it should be done, and then the next day, oh, we're totally doing it totally different. If this happens like three or five times, I'm heavily considering uh, going out of that project or that company. So this should be a massive red flag 
because this red flag will create a lot of frustration for you personally. So always watch out for these specific ones. And there is one slight adjustment. If there's a reasonable explanation, it can be accepted. Changing teams, I will not go into this one, but for all the managers here, uh, never change teams unless it's extremely necessary and unless the person was at least half a year in the team. I understand sometimes you need to do it, but always treat this very carefully because this will create a lot of frustration for people and you're losing money and productivity because the person has to onboard in the new team. Impact on life, this is the, this is the one slide where I say you cannot keep a secret for, from uh, people uh, if it's impacting directly their life. I have seen and actually participated, I won't tell the project, in which year, in which company it happened, but I have seen uh, a company being announced that it will be closed overnight. And the problem was uh, that a lot of people were affected by this in the case of they had to gain, a, a renew their visa because it was a European country. And if you're aware of this, if you don't renew visa and you don't have a work, you will be extradited. So their real livelihood were affected by this, and this is where you as a company don't have the uh, gratitude or the opportunity to, uh, to keep it as a secret. You, if you have at least some moral decency, you should always keep people in the loop and tell them, hey, there's a probability we're gonna close a company in two weeks or a month or whatever the case may be, but if you don't disclose this information, I will never trust you as a person or as a company, wherever you work because this will always be over you. Hiding competency, this is a small nudge to yes, uh, last year's presentation. If you're a, pro a manager that is incompetent, trust me, people will notice. So don't try to hide it. If you don't know something, you want to be educated on this, uh, ask for, for the knowledge. If you are a developer or a professional that see that the, your manager is incompetent, my best advice to you, Educate them without them understanding that you're educating them. Because you want your manager to succeed because if you have a manager that succeeds, he will help your team grow. If you criticize the manager and don't teach them, well, you'll get what you get. And uh, one awesome point uh, th that a lot of people overlook, especially teammates and employees, is that the fact that there are two types of decisions, based, uh, bad decisions based on maliciousness or on stupidity. Who is afraid of malicious decisions? Raise your hands. Who is afraid of stupid decisions? Yes, the stupid decisions actually overweigh the malicious decisions. Do you know why? Because when it's a malicious decision, I can at least understand why they're doing it. If it's a stupid decision, I'm afraid. Why are they doing this? So always be afraid of a stupid decision and not a malicious one, because a malicious one at least can be justified. A stupid one, never, and it creates only problems. So if we talk about how do you put it into a framework and how do you try to understand which type of manager is in front of you, what mistakes they're making, and how you should deal with it. First of all, your best thing is to not criticize, but try to actually understand what is the decision behind it and the reason behind it, because this will give you some ammunition to understand how to better proceed. The next best thing, never communicate with a manager that's doing bad decisions in a public, in a group space, but one, in a one-on-one -on -one session on the coffee space. Like, that's where you might actually get some insight from your manager, why things are happening the way they are, and you can get some insights on how better to proceed and preserve your future. And last, there's always context. This presentation is hard to do because there is no the same situation. Each situation is always has its own context, its own nuance, so you can't actually predict and give, okay, here's how you act in this situation. I can never say you that. We can discuss over coffee when uh, the presentation is done, after you also watch Sergey, he has an awesome presentation, by the way. So after that, we can amazingly talk about it. But I'm not done, so here comes the surprise. Do you really think that the management is the only person responsible about making a bad team and making the, mi the team miserable? Oh no, guys, you also are to blame here. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about the employee. The employee that also makes the team miserable because it's not just, the manager of course has a bigger impact, but over time, a toxic employee can also create a very unfavorable condition to work and makes the manager even mad and make even worse for decisions. So this one is for you to keep accountable the colleagues that you were not aware are actually bad for the team and for your group and for the success of your project. First of all, the, my favorite best hero framework. 
Unfortunately, I can't use the original one, but I think uh, most of the Russian-speaking audi audience knows the expression, Я Дартанян, вы все остальные. Yes. Uh, so this is maybe the worst framework to have um, because you should always remember that you're part of a collective and you work as a collective and you contribute to something as a collective. It's never one person, the one that actually like does everything for everybody. I can't do something by myself. A developer can do something by themselves. A QA cannot do something by themselves. Nobody can do something by themselves in a project or a team. So always think of yourself as part of the collective and you have to contribute to everything as a collective. If you have this mindset, uh, you're a bad team player and you should not be working in a team. Maybe a freelancer is good for you. So because the, the question is always about ego and actually most of the problems uh, on an employee level are about ego. Uh, the worst one for me is I know best. So I've seen multiple cases where developers I'll be very honest here. Uh, this is a personal case and a personal uh, uh, pain that developers are like, I know business better than you do. I, I, he doesn't talk with customers. He has no business numbers. Even though I present all of the business numbers, I talk to the customers constantly. I know that this will be better for the customer because I have X amount of years of experience. Yeah, but you don't have the business context. You don't have the understandings. You're not in the interviews. You're, you, I will listen always to a developer what they have to say, but I will explain why their idea won't work. And even, e even if after that the person will insist their idea is the best, sorry, we will have a problem working together. Because I will have my responsibility as a product manager because I'm responsible and I'm the voice of the customer. You're the technical person. I have no say in how you develop something because you're the expert on that. So my expectation is that everybody holds their responsibility. What Vitaly was uh, talking about yesterday. Everybody has their role and they have their own zone of responsibility. So you should always be aware. You want to make business decisions? Cool, become a product manager and make business decisions. I am the victim, uh, also a uh, lifetime favorite. Uh, people that constantly complain, everybody's against me, uh, everybody uh, is hating me. People, I will tell you very honest, nobody cares about you. Do you know why? Because everybody has their own problems to deal with. So if something you think is happening because people don't like you or you think people are working against you, you just have a perspective. Of course, there are exceptions. I won't say there, there to every rule there's an exception. But most often than not, just people care about themselves more than they care about you. And that's just the unfortunate reality. This is where you have to have enough emotional intelligence to understand who is the problem, what is the source of the problem, and you have to work with it and you have to negotiate with people. The one-man army myth, only if you're a one person, and I know maybe five projects total, and usually they're game development projects where just one person did design, development, storytelling, release management, everything. There's only one case I know that, uh, like one that immediately comes to mind, but there are very few projects where one person is responsible for all of the success. Never works. Most of the times never works, but there are exceptions as well. Not asking for help, that is maybe the worst thing you can do. Uh, again, it's about the ego thing. I, know I can do everything myself. Please ask for help. Don't ask it. If you're ashamed to ask it in public, you, you don't want to say it in the daily scrum, ask it for somebody. Ask it in one-on-one -on -one with your product manager, team lead, whoever. Ask for help. It's not a shameful. Blaming others, again, it's very similar to uh, the ego thing and like thinking that people hate you. No. Uh, I've seen on multiple occasions when uh, a developer, he was a junior developer, and he was blaming always the QA team that they're uh, especially don't like his user stories and they're constantly turning back the, the user stories. Dude, no it's not, it's just you. <laughs> so don't blame others for your mistakes, that's not how it works. Uh, worst mentality you can have is I win, you lose. Again, you're a collective of a group, so if everybody wins in the group, you win as a group. But if in, in you have an unhealthy competition in the group that you want to succeed more than your fellow developer from the same team, or a fellow designer from the same team, or QA, or whatever, that's the wrong mentality to have, and you maybe should not be in a team. Again, freelancing is pretty fine, but this is something that is not acceptable. Not communicating a problem, endless. I, always, I start always this from, because people again, they're afraid to say something, and I understand why, because in the past, in this region, if you were talked about the problem, you were excommunicated or you were shamed for that because we don't have problems, everything is fine. Uh, th there is no war in Bossing Se, 
for those of you who watched Avatar. So yeah, you should always talk about the problem. And the last one, uh, and I'm pretty sure some people will hate me for this one, but this is a current one. I talk with a lot of people about this one. And uh, we'll, we're, we'll have some heated conversations, but my salary didn't grow in this year's review. I'll let you sink in because our market, I will be honest with you guys, our market was oversaturated a couple of years ago with unreasonably high salaries. A lot of companies actually, how we say it gently, made the salaries too high and now people in the last one or two years where we have a global recession, we, had, we barely recovered from the pandemic, companies don't actually have a budget to raise your salary. And here's one thing about it. Um, it's very cool if your company can afford to keep you and keep you on, especially they keep you on a bench. If you were lucky enough to be in a company that take, took care of you to keep you on the bench, that's fantastic and that's amazing. Uh, if you think that the company is not appreciating you enough by a salary, stop complaining and explore other opportunities. And this is not me saying this to you, this is, a lot of managers, I talked about this problem and they told, they don't mind and they actually endorse, if you think that you're underappreciated by salary perspective, go and interviews. They actually endorse you to go and do interviews with other people, with other companies. And then you can see how much would you be valued in a different company. So this is a topic we can discuss on the pause because I, it's a very hot topic right now, but yeah, this is my opinion and you can hate me for that, but that's my, still my opinion. So I have one minute and a half. I hope Anton won't hate me and you will need uh, two, three more minutes. No. <laughs> uh, you took some time for me, uh, from me because of the pizza. Uh, so how do you make decisions and how do you continue? First of all, I really want you to uh, never think of things as black and white. They're never black and white in absolutely no situation. They're always somewhere gray A, because Every situation, every company, every team, every person has its own context and nuance. And that's unfortunately the reality. We are humans and we are complex beings, so we cannot have a solution for every situation, the exact same solution. That's just reality. You have to always remember that you're part of the group. And this is where you make the decision. Do you want to be part of a group? Or, you, and you want, or maybe you want to build something alone? But when you're building something alone, always remember, you can only build only a big enough project because you're limited. So if you really are inspired to build something big, and this is what happens when you need a group, you have to make the honest decision. What do you want? Do you want to build something small but comfortable or do you want to build something massive and gigantic? I made my decision. I only want to build amazing big projects. I do pet projects pet by myself, but I really can't imagine myself working alone and I always want to be an amazing team, a big team and coordinate and make something gigantic and amazing. So always consider the perspective in which you are in and never look at the problem or the situation you're in for just from your perspective because otherwise you will be very limited and you won't actually find a solution. So coming back to the original, when choosing a company, how do you do it? What's the answer for it? I will tell you I don't have one. But you can figure it out with, your, with the help of your own community, with the colleagues you work with, with the people that are near you, with your family and friends, and maybe with a mentor if you have one. That's the best way to figure out for your context, for your situation. And some closing remarks, because I see Anton is already near me. Uh, first of all, either as a manager or as an employee, member of a team, be honest with the team. Be careful, of course, honesty can, be, can bite you uh, in the butt. So be careful how you present, when do you present it, and to whom you present it. Always take a look in the mirror, maybe you're the problem. Because if you don't look in the mirror, at some point, uh, I talked yesterday with uh, Manuel, he very distinctly said, if you don't address a problem in your life, it will come back and hit you hard. Uh, and this is maybe my favorite expression for this, because if you don't deal with the problem, this is what's gonna happen. <laughs> That's just uh, crude reality how it works. And last phrase, uh, my personal belief is that we can survive as a species if we always look at the collective good of humanity. This is maybe too much, 
too much to ask from you. So my ask for, for you today uh, is consider the collective good of your community, your family, your friends, your colleagues. Don't try to change the world. Try at least to change yourself and the people close around you so make, you make something comfortable. Thank you, and let's talk afterwards. <laughs> Woo! Roma, thank you. Uh, we don't have time for questions, but let's have one question, if you'd like, or you're just impressed. Uh, hi, Roman. So my question is, in the context of a startup, when basically there's one developer, most likely, um, what advice will you give that one developer when uh, faces hard decisions like what to use, what to do, how to implement things, and so on? Um, I consulted at this point, just to understand where I'm coming from this, I consulted at this point more than 300 startups, and I have seen all variations of teams. The short answer is uh, you have two op amazing options. Find somebody else to work with, because being alone in this journey is not fun. And the or the second option is join an acceleration program, and then you have peers with whom you can talk with. Because when I work with accelerators where there's only one founder, they find a lot of appreciation that I, they can talk with me and they can think about other ideas they have in their head with me or like if they just, even just they tell them, them to me and they can, oh, but actually as I'm talking to you, I'm figuring out this thing. So you need company. Startups are brutal and unforgiving. So it's better to have company either as a partner or in an acceleration program. Ooh, thank you. Thank you, Roma.